So Victoria joins us from rest of the world, which is um, a journalism product online only um, that looks particularly at equities on, on technological issues across the world. And she's the features editor based in London. Scott Simon joins us from NPR, where he is Mr. Weekend Edition. <laughs> but Not tell what my me. children call me. But yeah, <laughs> what do they call you, Scott? Uh, Baba, actually. Yeah. Oh. Chinese for father. Okay, yeah. good. Um, I have a question for both of you. We've, uh, two things I've heard several times. I just started taking notes. I've heard some things aren't getting enough press. And then this morning, I heard very clearly about hype. How on a complex yes, I'm, issue I'm glad like to this. hear that Quantum will let us fill out our tax documents right, with greater exactly. <laughs> expeditiousness. I think that's the key to understanding, yeah. How do you manage hype on a complex issue like this? How do you know that you've got the right balance, Scott, when you talk to somebody on... Well, I suppose you don't money. know. Um, you, do, you do the best you can, and some people, some news sources are more conscientious than others. I also... I mean, I didn't see that article. My inclination is to blame the headline writer, not the reporter. Uh, but that, Key point. That might, Although those two people are sometimes the same thing. They're sometimes and increasingly the same thing. I, I might be a little parochial there. But um, I also think it's not necessarily bad to do a piece that includes that, that particular perception, uh, particularly if it makes a you know, a connection with people. But there's, there's no guarantee about that. I mean, I, I think we, we talk about what can the media do, and as you and I and Victoria actually have, have uh, discussed before this, uh, there is no the media hmm. anymore. Um, I, I mean, my, my wife and I joke about the fact that, that some people are interested in speaking with me just because of my Twitter following. Hmm. But uh, Katy Perry can tweet something about um, quantum mechanics or artificial intelligence and reach 108 million people. Um, so obviously that would potentially have, have, have greater impact. Now, everything I know about Katy Perry would suggest that she'd try and be responsible um, <laughs> and, and wouldn't turn herself over to the hype. But um, in any event, what we call the media is so fractured and so divided um, and, and, and often people who are providing information don't have uh, the traditional sense of, of discipline that you might have in the professional media. And for that matter, the professional media sometimes lacks that too. You actually, uh, Scott is a generalist, I'm a generalist. You are actually a, a tech journalist. She um, knows what she's talking about. She knows about. what she, we hope she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Tell us, how do you gain balance and perspective, particularly when you have also this um, uh, motivation to understand issues of equity and in a swiftly changing field like technology? Yeah, I mean, I think with, with quantum in particular, we've talked about how, um, you know, it seems scary. It seems scary to readers. It seems scary to journalists, I think. Um, there's something about it and maybe other topics in physics in particular um, where you kind of think like, oh, well, I don't, I don't know enough about that. Um, and most journalists, even tech journalists, are not going to be quantum experts, even if they are. Um, you know, even if they've got a PhD or something in quantum mechanics, that will be in a very specific area, and they might not necessarily know about everything to do with it. Um, so, how do we approach that? I mean, to be honest, I think just like you would any other journalism subject, I don't think science or co even complex science should really be treated that differently. You know, you go to the sources that you need to go to to get the information. You go to multiple sources, um, you do the research, you do but the you're doing it all so quickly now. I know you're a features writer, but the pressure now is to get things up right away. Yeah, there's always going to be yeah. that pressure. So um, it's, it's something you've got to balance out, you know. Um, but it really comes down just to doing the reporting. Um, and doing the fact checking and being diligent and uh, Making well, sure that you're we have a message. room of experts among us, and they have expressed a, quite a lot of um, varied views on how soon quantum will be a reality, uh, what's hype, what's not. Which is the trusted expert, or do you take little bits from everybody? Well, I think everybody here is a trusted expert. <laughs> I want to take the opportunity so, to say that. I, I think it's fair to say that there's a divergence of uh, there's a divergence of viewpoint on that. I think it's necessary to say that there's a uh, a divergence of viewpoint on that. I mean, one of the things that I, I think we have to be careful about, particularly talking about um, 
what are maybe infortuitously described as um, evolving or future technologies is that we can't apply the same sense of, of discipline or proof that we can for something mm. that isn't done yet. Mm. And uh, yeah, we, we, we turn ourselves over to the risk of hyperbole and predictions that don't pan out, which we've heard um, a lot about. The best that we can would try and do is be responsible. I mean, it's not, you could make a very impressive list of predictions for the future that never turned out that were uh, quite yes. confidently expressed in uh, in major media of the time, and I'm I believe I've done that myself on more than a few stories. And uh, it's not enough to just say we were wrong and keep going. I, I also think this represents an opportunity. I mean, I, I I think the expertise that Victoria represents, not just in terms of her reporting, but the audience, right, is something that's important. I want to say in the next breath. I think it's also important to occasionally be naive, to not sign yourself up and, and, and bury yourself simply in expert opinion, but to sometimes continue outside of that bubble and ask a, a question like Charlie Bolden did yesterday, well, why? Uh, why should we do this? And I, and, and I thought, by the way, your answers were quite cogent, but I think it's, I think it's also, particularly the one, if we don't do it, somebody else is already doing it. But I think it's important to uh, to ask that question about just about everything. Talk to me a little bit more, Victoria, about the role of explanatory journalism, um, about communicating what's going on, and also then how that differs from holding people to account, which journalists take as a very serious part of their role. Yeah, I think there is something of a difference between um, what I'd call science communication and science journalism. Um, so science communication is very important. It's um, you know communicating some of these complex ideas to yeah. a general audience. Um, it's something that journalists do. It's something also that you know a lot of people in this room probably do, or the institutions that you represent probably put out messaging trying to explain the work that you're doing to general readers. Um, but science journalism, I think, is not just that, and it's important that it goes beyond that. We're not just about explaining how technology works. Uh, we're about looking at the whole picture. Um, you know, asking those difficult questions about, well, how are we going to use this? What are the potential pitfalls as well as the, the hopes for what this technology will do? Who's going to use it? Who's going to own it? Um, who's going to have access? Um, and, you know, looking at the sort of political, cultural, social context as well. And I think the accountability aspect is really important there too. You know, journal as journalists, that's kind of our job, mm -hmm. you know, to speak truth to power. That's what we aim to do. And Technology companies in particular today, they have more and more power, yeah. um, you know, economic power, right. political power over every aspect of our lives. And so that is a really critical piece. And, so and, and unelected and not part of the democratic process right. uh, for reasons but which, by the way, I, I, I respect. There are certain questions which I think are impossible maybe to submit or resolve through the democratic process. And, and we have to understand that, too. But I, I do think it's the job of people in journalism to, uh, the phrase we use, unfortunately, is hold the feet to the fire. But I think that that's absolutely true, particularly because such um, potentially momentous decisions are, are being made or not being made. They're simply left to the, uh, to the play of technology. So, so you've both mentioned the term science journalism. One of the things I've always thought was important about science journalism and differentiated it from political journalism is that there was a preponderance of evidence and we didn't have to write yeah. he said, she said journalism, which has been so problematic in many areas, particularly in political journalism. But in the last two years, science has been, uh, you know, yeah. I, when I think about the preponderance of evidence, I mean, we didn't have to quote a flat earther uh, in a climate piece that the evidence had moved, el moved elsewhere, thank God. And that could be held very true. You could dismiss yeah. uh, a whole, we, whole we schools. We can quote a flat earther, but not in a climate piece. I mean, if a, if a flat earther has <laughs> something to say about the World Cup, I want to hear their opinion. And we could yeah. do a whole feature about why people are still flat earthers, but they don't yeah. deserve an equal balance in a story. Yeah. Um, and I thought always this had lessons for political journalism, where sometimes untruth has been balanced with truth just because there was a one came from one yeah. part of the political spectrum. But but right now, science is being so questioned. and. And with a topic like quantum, it's so difficult yeah. to explain to people. I, I mean, I, I don't that, I don't want to be a tireless or tiresome uh, defender of journalism. In fact, you can find a lot of scientists who have turned them, their, some, themselves over 
for that kind of use and that kind of credit. Maybe not a lot, but right. a few scientists that have been prominently quoted by people who have uh, disputed scientific opinion, and they turn themselves over to people that, that sometimes have the worst kind of reasons for uh, for promoting that sort of misinformation and, uh, and disinformation. Victoria, the, this mission you have um, of sort of equity and understanding the parts of the world that are often forgotten as, um, you know, journalism gets driven out of the same countries often that uh, yeah. these huge technological advances are come out of. What have you learned in the short time since this company was founded? Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Rest of the World, its background. And uh, gosh, yes. So um, Rest of the World, for, for those of you who don't know, is um, we're a tech pu publication for a general audience, um, but we cover uh, uh, basically places that are um, underserved and often overlooked. And by that, we mean essentially everywhere that isn't North America and Western Europe. <laughs> um, so I work with editors across Latin America, Africa, Asia, South Asia, Eastern Europe, um, and we're looking for technology stories uh, originating in those regions, whether that's looking at um, you know, technology companies based in those countries or um, you know, the use of technologies uh, in those countries or the impact of um, global tech companies, US-based tech companies on these regions where they're often, you know, maybe not being held to account by um, a technology journalism ecosystem, which is less developed in a lot of these places. Um, what have I learned? Mm. Um, I've been working there for a year. Um, gosh, that's a big question. I mean, I think I've learned not to make any assumptions <laughs> um, and also learned the importance of um, hearing from the people who are directly affected. You know, I can sit here, I'm from London, you can probably tell I'm British, my accent. We're here in the Ritz of all places. Right. Um, you know, far be it for me to kind of talk about the global south and what issues are being faced there. We need to go to the people who, who actually live there, who face issues, and find out from them what the important issues are, um, what their experience is, what they think needs to be reflected in the journalism we do. What are the stories that we should be covering? Um, and not kind of just rely on our own perspective um, to, to get those stories. I think that's the main takeaway for me. So that makes me think a lot about issues that your organization and mine have been grappling with, and that is making sure you have a diverse enough newsroom to bring in stories that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Oh, yeah, and, and I... Um, Same. And I... Uh, I'm concerned that, that during the pandemic, it, it became so easy to, to reach people through Zoom that, uh, that we have lost the touch of getting out into the world and, and, and actually talking to people face to face and, and uh, putting something together of their lives. I, I, I should also add that people who live in the world uh, can feel perfectly capable of telling their own stories now. Right. And, we ought, to, and right. we ought to note that, that. And how many people here have sub stacks? I mean, we, I know Sergio has a sub stack and O'Brien does, so everybody's, we're not needed, or are we? So well, I, you, you know, I, it, <laughs> the thought was as we were, I, 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 it's not obviously an original perception, but I mean, I think I can, I, I can foresee a future in which uh, the two professions that I think a lot of our parents thought would be, uh, what a shame that we didn't pursue them because they would be irreplaceable, would be doctors and lawyers. I can see ways now in, in which through art of the use of artificial intelligence, doctors and lawyers will absolutely be uh, replaceable. And, and I'm sure journalists will be on that list way before that. Oh. And, 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 and there is a significant amount of journalism or what I think people are consuming is what they think to be journalism that is now written by, by bots. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I expect that to uh, only increase and people will, I'm sure, have very comprehensive uh, reasons for it. We're running out of time, but when I spoke to you the evening we arrived, you gave me an example of a story you'd been covering, which was a multiple kidney transplant. Oh. And it was so clear that the narrative, and I have this question for both of you, the importance of you being there, witnessing that, a narrative was yeah. the way I, you I, it, that Well, I was, I was, this was at Houston Methodist, and it was a 10-way kidney transplant, so, uh, which, which happens every now and then in, in the world, but it's, it's, it's absolutely still worth covering, and we had been cultivating the sources there. And I was absolutely impressed by 
the skill and dedication of the doctors, who, by the way, and, and the nursing crew, who would tell me not to refer to it as a miracle, because you would never get anyone to submit to a miracle, uh, they would say, no, this is actually, this is actually plumbing. We, <laughs> we, we do this several times a year, and we know how to do it. We can do it. I was in these politically divided times, as I told you. They were, of the 20 people, I believe 18 of them were Texans. I think they were on all sides of the political divide. But you went to somebody, and if you told them, you know, you can, you can donate half your kidney, and it will save the life of somebody, they didn't say, well, who did they vote for? Who do they want to vote for? Uh, what's their position on, on such and such an issue? They said, well, I can save somebody's life. Uh, I'll do it. I was also, uh, in line with what we've been talking about, impressed by the fact that the, 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 the perhaps greatest um, transplant surgeon in the country there at Houston Methodist said, you know, in a few years, we'll just be looking on. The machines will be doing this, and, right. and, and we will be there to throw a switch if something is going wrong or a decision has to be made. But in fact, the machines can do it much more quickly, which is better for the patient. Um, uh, and, and we have to be aware of the fact that if they make a mistake, it'll happen so quickly, maybe we can't deal with maybe it. And I didn't forget that. Victoria, I want to give you the la just the last word. We're out of time. But um, the import importance of narrative, you're a features writer, and you're dealing with the whole diverse world. How do you recognize a story that you know you want to devote time to, devote a journalist's time in the field to, and to produce for your publication? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, that's a, that's a really difficult question because, you know, I guess the answer is kind of like, you know, when you see it, um, which is very unhelpful to anyone. But I think it's always something that just sticks with you from a human perspective, right? You know, and this is why I'm a big believer in long-form narrative journalism. And, and, you know, we see that people do actually take the time to read long-form stories, despite having all these, um, you know, really short bites of news wherever, wherever you can, mm. can look. People will seek out um, long-form narrative journalism. And I think that is just because of that staying power of the emotive pull of being yeah. able to thoroughly kind of understand other human beings and the experiences that they're going through which you can only really get from doing that um, on the ground reporting, actually being there, seeing things for yourself, as you say, Scott. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. always a big supporter of, of doing things properly. May, may <laughs> I add one thing that's on you my You want mind. the last word? Okay, go No, ahead. no, no, then she'll have the last word. <laughs> no, but no, it's, on my, it's on my mind here in Spain because I've been, as you know, rereading some, some World War II history. There was a lot of good reporting done during the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s right. in the Western right. press a lot of not so very good reporting. What do we remember? Hemingway and Orwell. Right, absolutely. Thank you both very much for helping us try to explain science journalism, tech journalism. Okay. Scott and Victoria. Thanks.